The how of happiness, the happiness advantage, stumbling on happiness. Walk into any bookshop and you'll find thousands of books giving you recipes on how to be happy. As if being happy is the goal, it is our priority, it is how to win in life. In the age of consumerism, capitalism and advertising, we are constantly bombarded with images of the perfect life that we can achieve if we just buy, if we just look like, if we just do. And that leaves us disappointed in our lives, feeling that we are failing in some way, constantly chasing a carrot and feeling like we're one step away from happily ever after. But the reality is, no one is that kind of happy. According to the World Health Organization figures of 2015, about 4% of the world is suffering from depression. That's 300 million people. And according to the NAMC, a 450% increase from 1987. So it seems that the more we strive for happiness, the harder it is to reach. The reality is life is hard for everyone. No matter what you do or how you do it, you can't escape negative feelings or negative emotions. There, our life is a mixture of both, positive and negative. And one cannot actually exist without the other. You can only feel happy because you have once felt sad. In the same way, that happy, that hot, means nothing without cold. And if you believe in this, you can free yourself from questions like, why now or why me? I was diagnosed with depression for the first time at the age of 17, although I suspected that it started much earlier. I had been brought up between four cultures, each with its set of rules and its set of shoulds. By trying to fit into one, by default, I was failing in another. I was overweight, shy, immigrant, trying to fit in, and it was hard. I can tell you about the time when I went to my school in London. I had just come back from a summer in Egypt, and I went up to the blackboard in my French school, where the teacher asked me to write something on the board, and I wrote it from right to left. Of course, my classmates laughed. They couldn't understand my mistake, and I definitely couldn't explain my confusion. Or I could tell you about the time when we used to come in Egypt in summer, and my family would meet me at the airport, take one look at my very skinny sister and say, have you been eating your sister's food again? And again, this was met with what felt like universal laughter. So thousands of these little moments of shame, of anger, of sadness were put away. Like any te teenager, I was trying to make sense of the world and to find my place in it, but it was hard. It felt like my feelings were getting in the way. So I learned to withdraw and feel safer, but invisible. Be fast, be proactive, be strong, get out of your own way, make lemonade, buy another bottle of milk. The cliches are endless and the message is deafening. Your feelings get in the way. Imagine when you see a child in distress and the parent will run to make it feel better, either by giving it a toy or a chocolate in the hope of distracting it, or they will try to toughen them up with messages like, big girls don't cry, or are you a baby? So we learn to feel ashamed about our feelings. And this doesn't change as we get older. Your teacher doesn't want to hear about your anxiety when you don't hand in an assignment. Your mother doesn't want to deal with your tantrum when she's late for work. And your father doesn't want to hear how not staying out with your friends only increases your isolation. So you learn that your feelings are not important. Not only are your feelings an inconvenience, but you can't trust them. Being happy, sad, uh, anxious, or even in love blinds you to the truth. Yes? So we learn to avoid, to ignore, to dismiss, to repress, and if you're particularly proactive, to think your way out of your feelings. Khalil Gibran once said, many of us spend our whole lives running from our feelings with the mistaken belief that we cannot bear the, the pain, but we have already borne the pain. What we have not done is feel all that we are beyond that pain. So why this adversity with our feelings? Perhaps because we do not understand them. Imagine that your entire being is talking to you in a language that you don't understand. So your job then becomes to listen, to decipher, and to accept. My first step in my therapeutic journey was to learn to identify my feelings. I realized that I had divided all my feelings into good and bad before ignoring them. And today, after five years as a counselor, it is still the same first step with many of our clients, to reverse our learned disassociations. The hardest thing you can try to do 
is to sit with your feelings. We have been trained and we have learned to avoid pain. But avoiding pain doesn't get rid of these feelings, but it gets you stuck in a battle with them. And they will wait until you are tired, until you are weak, and you will, until you are sick. And then they will express themselves, either in your behavior, in your relationships, or in your body. What we need to do is let our feelings come. When we're happy, we don't really think about the feelings. We just let them go through us like a wave. But when we are experiencing negative feelings, we panic, we question, we judge ourselves. What if we didn't distract ourselves? What if instead we allowed ourselves to create space for this feeling? So when you lose someone, feel sad. When you hurt someone, feel guilty. And when you make a mistake, feel sad also. We are so keen to bypass this process. When you break up with a relationship, you are so desperate to do the mature thing and to jump into being friends and acceptance. But the only true way to heal is to go through the feelings. The pain doesn't last forever, even if it feels like it will. So instead, try to make your world smaller. Don't think so much about the future. Resist jumping into actions. Just focus on this moment. Just feel. It's also important to validate your emotion. Bradley Nelson, the author of The Emotion Code, says, without feelings, we merely exist. Feelings are what color our world, what give our life meaning. They can come from something in the present or they can carry echoes of the past. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard people say, I know I shouldn't feel this way. We are so quick to judge ourselves and judge our feelings because they are negative. And this stops us from asking the more important questions. Why am I feeling this way? Or what is this feeling trying to tell me? Our feelings are not just feelings. We have to consider our thoughts because we interpret our, our feelings and that's what gives them life. And we choose the explanation that best fits our own narrative. So if I fail, I don't just feel sad. I think, of course, I deserve it because I'm shy or I don't fit in or because I am a failure. I hold on to the feeling because it confirms my fears. So if you think about it, we have two imperfect navigation systems our thoughts and our feelings, and we need both of them to be able to tell us where to go. Researchers have found that our body emits electrical energy and that different feelings give off different frequencies. So it's almost like our feelings are trying to talk to us and every feeling says something different. When you're sad, perhaps you're experiencing a loss of something. When you're scared, there is a threat to be attended to, and when you're anger, you are protecting yourself. We don't always understand our feelings, though. So when I break up, as I used the example earlier, and you feel sad, that is, doesn't mean that you need to go back into their relationship. So what is it telling you? Maybe it's telling you that it is important and you need to take your time. Or maybe it's telling you that you need support and you need to seek help so that you can heal. Feelings are very strong and they call us into action, but they must be questioned and they must be explored. So ask yourself questions like, what triggered this emotion? Have I felt like this before? What is my feeling telling me? And does my feeling or my reaction match the situation? Another important thing to be able to deal with feelings is communication. Find someone who can sit with your feelings and then express them. Sharing is extremely important. And over time, you can be that, place, that person for someone else. Hold their space while they work through their emotions. So remember that child who was in distress? What if instead their parents took this as an opportunity to teach them how to deal with feelings? Yeah. So they can listen to them, so the child feels understood. They can name their feelings so the child is not scared. They can try to help them find solutions, and when there are no solutions, hold them until the bad feelings go. I spent a lot of my life trying to avoid negative feelings, and what I've realized is that it is futile. It is much better to spend your time and your energy trying to develop the coping skills that will help you deal with them. Nothing was as terrifying for me as today's speech, and the organizers can tell you the many, many ways I tried to get out of it. 
But when it came to the crunch and I had to make a decision, I took time to really listen to my feeling. And what my fear was telling me is that this is important. It is important for me because it is the opposite of disappearing. And rather than take it as a prediction, a prediction of failure, I took it as an invitation to focus and to work hard. So in the words of John Green, it hurts because it matters.